Charles Hoskinson, Two Pen Charlie, just delivered an intellectual death blow to proof of work. Get ready. Let's go. We now have the Jack Dorsey edition of the Cardano Let's Educate Crypto Adjacent Celebrities video series. And it's a wholesale decapitation of the idea that Nakamoto style proof of work consensus will somehow continue to rule the day. Charles once again does a really good job here of very politely and very diplomatically debunking some misconceptions that are common in the crypto space. Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, is a gigantic, huge Bitcoin maximalist and proof of work maximalist. So Charles here, instead of going at Jack Dorsey like a lot of people would by trying to defame Bitcoin, Charles engages in first principles thinking. And where Bitcoin has done something well, Charles applauds Bitcoin throughout this presentation. But the reason why Charles comes off as so reasonable and measured in this presentation is because he's doing first principles thinking, right? What we mean by first principles thinking is that you start with principles first that are basically like true in all circumstances. So Charles starts by saying, okay, why do we even want consensus protocols? So proof of work and proof of stake are consensus protocols here. He asks, why do we want these consensus protocols? And he sort of let, lays out the need for, you know, like a solution to the Byzantine generals problem. And then he says, Hey, how do we solve this? He says, blockchain solve this, but in a blockchain, we have to come to some kind of consensus about who's going to make the next block and what's going to be in the next block. And then here's where the first principles thinking really kicks in and makes this presentation look extremely, extremely objective. And like something that's very difficult to, um, to dispute. So Charles says, okay, if we're going to come to a consensus about who's going to make the next block and what's going to be in the next block, let's talk about the, the steps that are required for that. He says, there are three steps. You've got to pick someone to make the next block. You've got to have that person make the next block and push it out to the network, distribute it to the ne network. And then the network has to accept that block into the blockchain. And here's where he makes a really good point. Steps two and three, the making and distribution of the block and acceptance of it into the blockchain. It's this, those are the same. Those two, those two steps are exactly the same for proof, proof of work and proof of stake. Where they differ is just on one, how you pick someone to make the next block. Charles points out that 99.9% .9 of the energy spent in proof of work is spent on number one. So really when we're talking about the difference between proof of stake and proof of work, the distinction really lies in one, which is super convenient because that's also where all the energy is spent in proof of work. And the piece that's been the most controversial lately, two things are very controversial about proof of work, that it uses a gigantic amount of energy, famously as much as some medium-sized countries lately, and also that it seems to tend to lead toward really, really serious centralization. In the case of Bitcoin, that centralization is in miners in certain parts of China. Then he goes on to point out, okay, proof of work in 2009 was a great way to deal with some of these distributed computing issues surrounding consensus. However, when we talk about proof of stake versus proof of work, we're talking about a system based on physical assets, ASICs, application specific integrated circuits, which are basically these computers about the size of last time I saw one about the size of a Kim, you know, cinder block, uh, you know, roughly the same shape. And I'm sure people will be jumping out of their chairs right now telling me they have ASICs of different sizes, different shapes, of course, not a problem. These physical assets, bunch of cinder blocks versus virtual assets. In 2021, it's really easy for someone to immediately comprehend why virtual assets might be better. We have data centers 
let's face it, we're talking about warehouses. There are warehouses of these cinder block size computers in China. And when a mine floods and a bunch of miners almost die and China has to do a bunch of stuff to the power grid, the hash rate on the Bitcoin network goes down. It goes down in traumatic ways, <laughs> ways that are not welcomed by the Bitcoin network. That's problematic. With virtual assets, you don't have to worry about that. Centralization of virtual assets is not really a thing because virtual assets can be moved across borders in terms of a click of a button. But really, if you think about it, virtual assets like staked ADA, they don't really exist in any given jurisdiction. Of course, the courts and laws of those jurisdictions would say they do exist within their jurisdiction, but for all intents and purposes, it doesn't matter if I'm in Asia, North America, or Europe, as long as I have my private key, virtual assets on the Cardano network are mine and they don't really have a jurisdiction. So there isn't a realistic chance of confiscation of virtual assets. Sure, it could be accomplished if, you know, if I was a, you know, gigantic criminal offender of some type and federal authorities drug me into federal court, they could compel me to give up my my private keys. But confiscation of virtual assets is not is largely not really a thing. Banning of virtual assets is largely not really a thing, right? We don't have we could have China fear, uncertainty, and doubt in regards to the banning of mining. They could just say, hey, no more warehouses full of ASICs, no more manufacturing of ASICs. They could say any of those types of things, and it's a huge problem for any proof of work network. Let's say the United States or Canada, Mexico comes out tomorrow and they say, hey, no more staking, we're banning staking. I think every single stake pool is going to be like, okay, um, my staking is now occurring in some other jurisdiction and it's not a big deal. There's no, there's no warehouse of computers that need, need to be moved. You know, fairly simple to move a staking operation from one jurisdiction to another. Very difficult to ban it. It's basically all happening virtually. So very difficult, very difficult to ban. Then Charles sits about to debunk another myth related to proof of stake. I've personally encountered this. Last time I had a uh, last time I sat down and had a face to face discussion with someone who is mining on a proof of work protocol, and this was a pretty small cap coin. This guy's been mining for years, so I, I kind of went into the conversation knowing that he's probably been in this little echo chamber just around that very low cap cryptocurrency for years. And so, you know, first thing when he sat down, immediately he was like super defensive because our mutual acquaintance, this is the first time I'd ever met this guy, but our mutual acquaintance had already told him I was uh, uh, very involved with uh, Cardano. And uh, he immediately started telling me how much money he was making every day mining this like number 500 coin or whatever it was and how many dollars worth of mining equipment he had. And... <laughs> Um, it was, I could tell he was, he was, I was just interested to talk to him and, you know, like hear about his experience mining this coin. I wasn't even thinking about, you know, the conversation taking on this tone of Cardano versus his number 500 coin or anything like that. But he obviously approached it that way. And that's why he was defensively justifying his involvement in this coin and, you know, talking to me about how much money he was making, but it's really interesting. After he got done telling me about how wonderful his experience mining this coin was, which only, you know, was in terms of how much money he was making, he immediately said, with your proof of stake coins, it's just like the rich get richer. And I didn't realize that's what the, the hardcore proof of work guys were, were always relying on, right? I, I thought... I thought this guy, if he was going to attack Cardano, he would go to other things besides this rich get richer narrative. But Charles also addresses this in his video. He he breaks out an academic paper that was actually done on how egalitarian proof of work versus proof of stake protocols are. And the academic work on this subject actually suggested that proof of stake is more egalitarian. 
which is the same. And, and I mean, it makes sense to me because when I talked to this miner of this like number 500 coin, the first thought through my head was, you just told me how much money you have invested in all of your mining equipment. I mean, graphics cards aren't cheap, right? I mean, he's he was mining with graphics cards, not even ASICs, which are more, you know, very expensive. My counter argument was you could mine with you know, a handful of, do I mean, you could uh, stake with a handful of dollars of Cardano. So I, I don't think this egalitarian, hey, proof of work allows anybody to mine on the network thing. In practice, it doesn't really hold true. I think in 20, 2009, 2010, 2011, that was probably true. I think in the early days, you could break out your laptop and mine Bitcoin, and it was very egalitarian. But Charles lays out the mechanics by which these proof of work networks become very centralized. He also talks about something very interesting that nobody really talks about very much. So proof of work has a nearest neighbor problem. So this is, this is the temptation that occurs when you've got two proof of work protocols that are near, near each other in market cap, there is a very strong set of incentives for someone to take a bunch of hashing power, a bunch of half hashing power, 51% attack the other network, short the assets of that blockchain, and then take their hash power and point it back at the blockchain that they're actually a supporter of. So obviously you could, you could cripple the trading price of a proof of work network if you 51% attack it. And if you've got two sort of adversarial proof of proof of work networks that are right next to each other on CMC or CoinGecko, if one of them starts going down, you know, it's pretty logical that people might trade out of that that network and, and into the other one. So you could make money both on your short and on your long. And Charles, you know, he kind of points out this is the way it's sort of played out, and you lead it, it leads to a winner takes all scenario, and we see that with Bitcoin. We have Bitcoin in terms of proof of work, and then there's everything else. This is very different than proof of stake. And Charles sort of charitably says, "Hey, Polkadot and Cardano, you know, they're pretty close to each other in market cap on most days. You know, they go up and down, but they're pretty close in." market cap and they don't attack each other like we don't suffer the we don't suffer 51 percent stake attacks from polka dot guys and cardano people don't try to figure out ways to go over and cripple you know the operations of polka dot or kusama right it's uh it doesn't happen because proof of stake doesn't have this nearest neighbor problem charles labels this as the difference between having external security security via external resources, ASIC miners in warehouses that we call data centers uh, versus having internal security that you have in proof of stake, right? Proof of stake is not relying on anything that is external to it, like physical, physical resources. By this point, Charles has pointed out that the difference between proof of work and proof of stake is just in how you pick who gets to validate the next block that the difference is really between one of whether that depends on virtual assets or physical assets, that security is actually better with the virtual assets, no 51% attacks of near neighbors, and that it's actually probably more egalitarian in proof of stake systems. Hasn't even addressed the environmental issues surrounding the immense energy use of proof of work. But then he goes on to tackle maybe the most fundamental thing, and that's the decentralization issue. The cool thing here is you don't even need to tell Bitcoin people how not decentralized Bitcoin is. 10, 10 groups control more than 50% of the mining in Bitcoin. You can go on a block explorer on Cardano and see a different stake pool validates the block every 10 or 15 seconds. And there's like 2,400 stake pools. It's a more decentralized system. The Bitcoin proof work maximalists defend their choice, their continued choice of Bitcoin on grounds of decentralization and security. But there's not really a case 
for greater decentralization or security in Bitcoin on the facts. Proof of work chains can get 51% attacked. They also, as a matter of fact, are way more centralized. So Charles kind of lays all this out at, you know, sort of a, with this continued first principles thinking, right? He's like, let's deal only in facts. It's not a persuasive essay, this video. He's just like, here are the problems that blockchain solve. Here's how we can go about solving them with proof of work and proof of stake. Here are the benefits and detriments of each system. It's hard to say on balance at the end, he's like, it's very difficult to say on balance that proof of stake is worse than proof of proof of work in any way. Um, he also addresses speed, obviously proof of stake as it currently stands much, much faster than proof of work. I would have a hard time putting, having any proof of work fan sit down and watch this video and, and believe that they could not be convinced that proof of stake is the future versus proof of work. This was a wholesale ass kicking of proof of work. Charles basically goes through every parameter by which we want to measure blockchains, every problem they solve, every benefit and detriment, and proof of stake comes up on top. I think it's just a matter of time now before all the Bitcoin maximalists capitulate and become proof of stake futurists. Talk to you tomorrow.